Let's get it going. So let's bow before the Lord. Thank you, Father God in heaven, for being with us. Thank you, God, that you're in our midst today. Thank you so much for your love of us. Thank you so much for sending your son to die for us. Thank you that we can come to you this time of year and remember the birth of our Savior. And thank you that you've given your word to us to learn from, to grow from. We ask you a blessing upon So if you are in Acts, I go to Acts 15, and we're going to kind of pick up where we left off last week, but we're going to backtrack just a smidge. And we're thankful that you're back in one piece, Randy. <laughs> One piece. He was a couple of pieces on Monday morning, but now he's one whole piece again. So that's good news. And last week, Randy left off with um, here in Acts, where we left off about verse 28. But it was kind of right in the middle of a thought. So we're going to back up just a little bit. And we're going to read a little bit more together today. And we're going to finish up Acts 15. And then we're going to talk about a couple other things. So let's start back in Acts 15, 22. And we're going to read it together. I'm reading out of the ESV version. So if it's a little different than yours, that's why. So Acts 15.22. Then it seemed good to the apostles and elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brothers with the following letter. So this is one letter starting right here. The brothers, both the apostles and the elders to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilia. Greetings. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words and settling your minds, although we gave them no instructions. It has seemed good to us having come to one accord, to choose men, and then send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Saul and Paul. Men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who have themselves, and will tell you the same thing by words of mouth, for it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, from blood, from what has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. So we are in verse 30 now. So when they went off, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. And Judas and Silas, who were with themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And after they had spent some time there, they sent off in peace, they were sent off in peace by the brothers to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. And we're on verse 36 now. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return to the Return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John, called Mark, but 
Paul thought best not to take with them the one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement, so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed. Having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord, and he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Cilicia, that's how you say it. So we're going to get to that part at the end there and talk a little bit about dissension, but let me go back up and just talk just briefly here about the letter that they wrote. Because in the first part up here that we read, um, they read the letter to the folks at um, in these areas, Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, and they were encouraged by the letter. And so some people are a little confused by why would he be encouraged by that letter? It doesn't sound very encouraging to us, maybe. Um, because they're giving them rules to follow. You shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. But when they were talking to these folks up in this area, we have to remember who they were. They were a group of Christian people that had come from a bunch of different folks, right? So some of them were... Jews, some of them were Gentiles, some of them were people that had no religious affiliation at all, they were just folks, right? And so when they talked to them about this, they were talking to them about a lot of the things that were going on in their society. So this letter was to kind of encourage them to stay away from the things in their society that would kind of draw them away from God. And we have a lot of those things in our society today as well. We might not have things that are necessarily strangled or sacrificed to idols from our point of view, but we have other things that distract us, right? We have, like, materialism. We have, like, who has the most jet skis or who has the most stuff wins. We have those kind of theories, right? They kind of draw us away from God a little bit. And I think that's kind of a little bit what they're talking about here, is that they, they're saying, you know, try to stay away from those things in society that are drawing you away from God. There were a couple of things that were going on. There were a couple of arguments and things that were going on here. One of them was that the Jewish people that were Christians felt that the Gentiles needed to be like the Jews if they were going to be real Christians. Right? We see that in our society today, don't we? Like, well, what does it mean to be a real Christian? How do we define that? What does it look like? Sometimes we have problems seeing that because we don't really understand that or we haven't thought about it very much or we hear this from this guy, this from this guy, and, and it's all different. So so what is really the truth? And I think that's what they got from this letter and their context was that they got some understanding. So I want to try to give you some understanding of that as well. I know some of you know this, but sometimes I don't think that we talk about it enough is what is it that really makes us a Christian and what are the important parts of being a Christian? And what is it that we should take away from that? So it's very, if you read, go back and read chapter 15 again. Um, it's really specific on that Jesus Christ and faith in him gives us the ability to say we're a Christian. There's nowhere in there that it says you have to have Jesus Christ and then you have to do all this other stuff. And I think that we have a problem with that sometimes. I do. Because I see, well, gosh, that guy's a Christian, but look at look at what he's doing. Look at the owner of Hobby Lobby. We were talking about that in men's group yesterday. Look at what he's done as a Christian. Have I done that? Probably not. Has God given me those resources to do that? No. So does he expect me to do that? No, he doesn't, right? So there's no, no addition to Jesus. It's Jesus Christ, that's it. That's all we need to have to be a Christian. That's all we need to have to be saved. We don't have to do all this other stuff. That's one of the arguments that they were going through in here is that the Jewish Christians said, well, 
Yes, you can believe in Jesus, but then you have to be circumcised. Remember we talked about that last week. Randy mentioned that as he was going through the first part of chapter 15. They said, well, yeah, it's okay to be to believe in Jesus, but then you need to be circumcised, and then you need to follow the Jewish laws and the Jewish customs and all that stuff, and that's what's going to make you a Christian. Nope. Wrong. What does Jesus tell us? He says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's it. He didn't say you have to do anything else. Right? When he was on the cross, what did he tell us? He said, it's finished. What does that mean to us? That should mean that he did it. It's done. There's nothing else that we have to do. All we have to do is have faith in him. That's it. Sounds simple, right? It's not always simple because we get all messed up in our heads sometimes trying to think, well, what about all these other things, right? I got to go to church. I got to be good. I got to do this. I got to do that, right? Does coming to church make us Christians? Heck no. But it sure should make us better Christians, maybe because we learn a little bit more about it, right? And then what can we do with that? We can take that and we can share with our friends and our family and our coworkers, even if we're in school. I know some of you guys are in school, and it's hard to be in school and be a Christian, especially to be like in high school, right? It's tough. I know, I was there one time, and it's hard to believe, but I was, right? It's tough to be a Christian and be in a, a secular high school these days, right? You gotta really be strong. But you know what? When you are strong like that, people see that. And they might not say it, they might not come up to you and go, wow, you're a great example of a Christian. But you know what? They can see it. Right? They can see it every single day. When we go to work, what do they see in us? I don't know. One of the things my dad told me one time, he says, it's really funny. When I go out and play golf, I'm the only guy that isn't cussing every time I hit the ball. He says, I think that's a pretty good witness. <laughs> I said, yeah. It sure is, because everybody else is out there. <laughs> you know, when they're hitting the ball because they can't hit it. Or it goes this way or that way or whatever. Right? So every little thing that we can do can be a witness, I think. We can be a witness when we go to the grocery store. You know, that we're not cutting people off in line. I mean, just little things in life, right? But do those acts make us a Christian? No, they don't. We're already a Christian, right? We're doing that stuff because... Jesus died for us. Jesus loves us. He's given us hope and given us life. And so we do those things because he first loved us. I think if we don't get anything else out of today, just remember that all you need is faith in Christ and you're good. You're going to heaven. Amen. You're going to be there. It might not seem like it this week. You might have a bad week. <laughs> Okay? Who knows? But you're going. Okay? And now what we're going to do is we're going to take that, that hope that we have, that love of Christ that we have, and now we're going to pass it on and share it with other people. Just the way that we live every single day. Okay? When things get rough, when you have a hard week, don't worry about it. Okay? It's not a big deal. It seems like a big deal at the time. I'm not saying that it's not, okay? Because sometimes we get overwhelmed. But if we take a step back and we just think, okay, Jesus has got us covered. So this might be a stressful thing. I might not like it. I might hate it. I might have a test I don't want to take because I'm not ready for it or something like that. But Jesus is with us. The big picture is covered, right? Don't worry about the malicious stuff. Again, easier said than done, but we can do it. So let's move down a little bit here, down into um, verse 36. Yeah, I'm just going to read a little bit of this again to you because it's, it's kind of an interesting thing that goes on here. 
And we, we see this in churches, and we see this in communities, and we see this in groups of Christians all the time. So this is a really good thing to kind of look at and kind of see what happened, because this is only part of the story. Unfortunately, they don't give us the whole story here, so I'm going to fill it in a little bit for you. But it says, after some days, this is uh, verse 36, after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Seems like a good idea, right? Go back and kind of see what's going on with the churches they planted. They're going to go back and kind of see how people are doing, um, visit the people that they knew, visit old friends and, and, and people like that, and kind of see how things are going. So, good idea. Um, Barnabas, though, in verse uh, 37, Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark. And there's lots of reasons for that, but one of the interesting reasons is that actually John Mark apparently was related to him. He was like his cousin or something like that. Um, so he, Barnabas wanted to take him along. Uh, but Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and not gone with them to the work. So Paul was thinking, this guy kind of bailed out on us when we were in Pamphylia. He didn't really come through. There was some problem there. And so he's like, nah, I'm not liking this guy. He's not really with us. I don't want him to come along. And so, in verse 39, it says, And there arose a sharp disagreement, so that they separated from each other. Ever had a disagreement in the church? No, that's never happened. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it just cracks me up when you see that. I'm like, wow, yeah. We do that all the time, don't we? You see that in denominations that split, right? The Baptist denominations that split over the years, different Catholic churches, different non-denominational churches that split because they don't like the color of the chairs or something like that, right? I mean, we hear stories about that all the time. But that's true, right? And right here, we have the same thing happening. A sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. I mean, these are two God-fearing guys. They are both doing the will of God. They are trying their best to serve Jesus. They are both phenomenal evangelists. They are prophets. I mean, these guys are like the top tier, right? Other than the apostles, these guys are right up there at the top, right? Paul even calls himself an apostle at one point because he did see Jesus. And we're not going to get into that. But these guys are leaders in the church, right? And now all of a sudden, they're like going like that. Is that human nature? Or is that just the way it goes? We just don't get along sometimes? Probably a little bit all those things, right? Um, but I think that God used it in this instance, right? It may have been that they were doing something that he they obviously had a disagreement. They obviously went different ways, and there was something going on there. They don't go into all the details. But now, all of a sudden, you have four guys going out instead of two guys going out. And they're going to literally change the world. I don't know. Maybe that was part of God's plan. Maybe that's why he, how he wanted it to happen. I don't know. It um, doesn't say that right here. Right? It just says that they had a disagreement. So... Again, we come back to the, the idea that James, Peter, Jesus all said that we're going to have trials and tribulations, right? And they're going to be promised to us. Isn't that great? But look at what these guys did with that, right? They had a disagreement. They went their separate ways. And eventually, they actually got over it and came back together. And John Mark became a, a great asset to the ministry. And we'll see that later on as we get in, into more of Acts. Um, but I just think it's really a, a good example of a time where things aren't going right. People have disagreements, and God uses it to his glory anyways. Because all these guys really wanted to glorify God, didn't they? I mean, I think that was their purpose. They really did. But there was something in there that got in the way. 
and God still works. So I think he can work in our lives when we have disagreements, when we have frustrations, when we have things that split us apart, maybe from a friend or whatever it is, right? Even sometimes in our jobs, sometimes you might find where you're in a job and it just isn't working out right, and you're like, eh, you need to go a different way, you need to get a different job or go, you need to move somewhere or whatever. God's going to use that. If you're really seeking God and seeking his heart, he's going to use that to benefit you He's going to glorify himself through us. Why is it that Paul and Barnabas were used so much by God? Does God need them? God doesn't need them. He doesn't need me. He doesn't need any of us. But for some reason, he has chosen us to be blessed by him and be used by him to glorify him. I think that's an amazing thing that he would spend his energy and time to teach us and help us to grow and use us. What a huge blessing for us, right? Any of you guys could be up here saying these things, not just me, right? He's just using me to bring up some of these points. It's not that I'm any different than you. We're all the same. You guys know me. I'm just a guy, right? <laughs> Nobody's special, right? Why, why, is God, why does God allow me to bring his word and share it with you? I don't know. What a blessing that he lets me do that. It's, it's through his grace and his mercy, you know, every single day that he lets us do what we do. He lets us interact with the people that we interact with. What a blessing just to have you guys here. It's awesome. Some of you guys I know, some of you guys I don't know. Some of you guys I know from a long ways back, right? So it's kind of a cool thing. And it's just a blessing from God that he uses us every single day. If you look, you can see Jesus working in your life every single day. Uh, Martha and I went on a mission trip a long time ago to Mexico. And we went down to El Paso, and we went across the border there. What was the name of that town there? Juarez. that's right. You wouldn't want to go to Juarez right now. Okay? <laughs> but a long time ago, we went down in there, and it was really interesting because we, we had this bus that we went on, went over the border, went down there. And the people that were leading the mission trip, every day they would stand up and say, okay, Keep your eyes open because we want to, at the end of the day, we want you guys to come back and tell us where you saw Jesus. And they said, we don't know where he's going to show up, but you're going to see him today. And I thought that was a really good practical example of what is Christ doing today. And every single day he did something. You could see him working somewhere, somehow. Sometimes it was a small thing. Sometimes it was a big thing. Sometimes it was something that was just helpful from a logistics standpoint. Sometimes it was reaching out to people that needed help that we didn't realize needed help. So I think that we can do that as well. As we go, tomorrow's Monday morning. We can get up, have some time with Christ, read the word a little bit, and say, hey, I'm going to see if I can see Jesus today. Why not? He says he's with us every day, right? I think sometimes we don't see him because we're not looking. I think if we open up our eyes and take a minute and look, he's going to be there. He might be working through us, right? Why does he want to use us? I don't know. But he's He might be working through us. He might be working with somebody else's life that we see. I mean, what a cool thing to do every single day. And that mission trip, I always thought that was like one of the best things that I learned on that trip. I don't know if I really helped anybody else while I was there, but I sure learned that. And I thought that was a great thing to do every single day, try to see what Jesus is doing in my life. Some of us have a job that is repetitive. Any of you guys have a repetitive job where you do some of the same things over and over? I know some people do. Some people like work at Lowe's Distribution Center, right? And what do they do? They lift up a box from here, and they put the box over here. 
and they do that thousands of times all day long, right? I mean, it, that's repetitive, right? Where do I see Jesus in that every day? I don't know. I would say open your eyes and look. I bet he's going to be there somewhere with something that happens, right? Some of us have jobs that you have no idea what's going to happen that day because you don't know who you're going to see, who you're going to talk to, what's going to happen. Jesus there too. So I would say keep your eyes open. He's around. Okay. So these guys had a sharp disagreement and they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and went to Cyprus and Paul chose Silas and they went a different direction. And by those guys doing that, people all throughout what we would call like Southern Europe, maybe Turkey area, um, parts of the Middle East all heard about Jesus because of that. And then it just spread like wildfire after that. What a great blessing that was. So um, just a quick little couple notes here that I uh, jotted down. Um, one of the things that I see when we have um, sharp disagreements with each other like, like these guys did is that sometimes we lose our focus um, and we kind of sometimes end up being a little selfish or self-centered or um, what's in it for me type situation and we're not really thinking about what God wants us to do or where he wants us to go. Um, so I put down a couple of verses here that um, are from the New Testament that I thought were um, kind of encouraging. Um, one of them's in Romans 12, 18. And you don't necessarily have to turn there, but it just says to try to be at peace with one another as best we can. It doesn't say we're going to be perfect at it, because we're not. But it just says to try to be at peace with, with those that are around you. Try to be the person to calm the situation down as opposed to escalate the situation. Some of us, when we were younger, we were probably a little bit better at escalating the situation <laughs> rather than calming the situation down. You know? So as we get older, sometimes that maturity helps us to kind of calm things down. But that's in Romans 12, 18. So that was, I like that verse. Um, in Hebrews 12, 14, it talks about pursuing peace. And your priority in the theme here, right? Peace is the theme. So it says to pursue peace, to pursue, um, like, um, I, I would say friendship. Not necessarily that you're going to like everybody, but try to just be at peace with everybody as best you can. And then the really super hard one, which is Ephesians 4.29, I think that's one of the hardest verses in the whole Bible. It says, let no unwholesome word. So I know when you get upset and things are going not good, sometimes it's hard to remember to watch your tongue, right? We could, we could talk about the whole first chapter of James right there, right? And there that, but we're not going to do that. Um, but there's hope for us to put our foot in our mouth or don't put our foot in our mouth, right? John 14, 27 says that Jesus is the one that gives us that peace. Right? And there's, a, there's some other verses that are good, too, about peace that passes understanding, things like that. Those are good. But I, I kind of like these. Um, just Jesus is the one that's given us that peace. We also know that um, in Galatians 5, it talks about the fruits of the Spirit, and one of those fruits being peace. So we know that if we have Jesus, that we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And we know that one of the gifts of the Spirit is peace. So how do we know that we have the gift of peace? Huh? Tough. I would say to look at what you do during the day. Are you causing dissension or are you causing peace? 
two days we want it, God is essentially we probably shouldn't. So feel free to read over Galatians 5 22 sometime and look at the fruits of the Spirit and work on those. It'll we'll give you plenty of work on the rest of your life. Lots of going on in there. So so that's all I really have. I have some other little things, but I want to get to mention one thing to you real quick because next week we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to talk about um, a little bit of preparation for Christmas. I always liked the Advent season and kind of thinking about um, what's coming up and how it's important to us as Christians and why it is that we celebrate the birth of Christ. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. So if you want to read up on the Advent season a little bit for next week, then you guys can teach it. Okay? <laughs> uh, but we'll talk about that and a little bit more about Christmas and just kind of help get us prepared for the Christmas season um, next week. Okay? So let's pray together, and then we're going to get back into our last worship, worship song. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for blessing us every single day that you give us a new day. When we wake up and we get to see the beautiful sunshine in Wyoming and a nice warm day like this, we're just so thankful for you allowing us to live here, to be able to work here, to be able to grow and be more like you here. We just ask, Father God, that you would help us to have peace from you and that we'd be able to pass that peace on to others. We thank you so much, Jesus, that you are the only thing that we need and you have already done all the work for us, that you bled, that you died for us, you have risen for us, that you've given us hope in the future, that you've given us hope for Monday morning and even for next year coming up, you've given us hope. We're just so thankful that you love us we're so thankful that you've chosen us to be your children. We ask, Father God, that you help us to continue to be better and better followers of you. Thank you again that we could gather here today, that we can worship you, that we can give you the glory and honor to be the God of all gods, the Lord of all worlds. We thank you so much for Jesus. Please stand for a minute to start off. <coughs> 